Okay, so Romans chapter 9, we're, I mean chapter 8, we're going to get into the second part in chapter 8, lesson number 30, and um, we're going to continue where we let off last week. Now, this I titled Cause and Effect, because we're really going to look at the why behind what we do. That's what Paul's talking about here, and it's really easy to get into a conditional salvation, even by osmosis, even even as, we, as we're reading through this, to read these passages and to say, well, the Bible says that if I'm not led by the Spirit of God, I'm not a son of God, so I need to walk up rightly because that's what the Spirit wants. That way I can be a son of God, which is con- it's, re- it's backwards. It's the wrong way to do it. It's, if you've ever tried to back up a buggy with a horse, it's difficult, right, to get your buggy before, before your horse is bad. It, it's, it's backwards to try to do what's right so that God will be pleased with you. When God is pleased with you, doing what's right comes natural. Now, when we get into this next section, we're going to look at Romans 8.13, which is just a couple verses past where we finished. And Paul says, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. Now, often this is taught as physical death. It's a neat little uh, um, way to get around in theology and say, Well, he's not saying you're going to go to hell. He's saying your flesh is going to die, but that's not what he's saying. Every time we come through Romans, the wages of sin is death. If you change that to physical death, that's a little screwy. But if you you recognize that he's saying the converse of eternal life is death, that's what he's saying. Here he says the converse of obedience to Christ is that you'll go to hell. Now, you, you say, well, that doesn't track. I don't believe that. I believe that I go to heaven based on what Christ did. Absolutely, that's what Paul's saying. That you'll be born again based on what Christ did, nothing to do with you. And that's why if you don't walk in the Spirit, don't walk after the Spirit, that you'll die in your sins. Now, I'm going to illustrate what that means, but there's a reason that Paul's doing that. The second half of 8.13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the Spirit... Do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. It is, Paul's talking about the causality of what you do, not what you do. In other words, if your purpose in life, if your cause in life, if your hope and your plan and your dream is to fulfill the desire of the flesh, in other words, if you're walking the way that your flesh wants you to walk, then you're not a Christian. And when you die, you'll go to hell. And Paul wants you to know that because he loves you. But if you're a Christian and you are part of God's kingdom, if you're part of his children and your desire is towards him, that you'll walk towards him. Now understand, this isn't a level of righteousness. It's not saying if you do these things, you'll be saved. And if you don't, then you'll be lost. It's not a level. If it were a level, we could fulfill it and say, okay, I'm safe. I've done it. The Pharisees said, I've kept all the commandments from my youth up. Now what? He'd finished. He'd done the righteousness, he thought, of the law. But he hadn't. You see, walking in the Spirit, you never fulfill it. You'll never finish. You'll never be righteous enough to say, I have attained the righteousness that I'm going to. Because it's a direction, not an amount. It's saying, I'm going towards Jesus. Now, if you get saved and you are you know, have all of these difficulties and issues in your life, and somebody comes along and says, look at you. Your life is not looking like a Christian. I knew this guy. He got born again. He had problems with dope, with alcohol, with language, with, with uh, fornication, all these issues. And he got saved. And the moment he got saved, he was born again and walking after the Spirit. And, and he still cursed. He still had problems with dope and with alcohol and with fornication. But he walked after the Spirit. In other words, he's here. The Spirit's there. I'm going that direction. I knew another man, older man. And, and he was so concerned with keeping the law. He got, was so concerned that he didn't wear blue jeans because that was of the world. He wore broad falls that were, that were shaped properly. And, and he would uh, talk about uh, not loving the world money, things like that. Wouldn't ride in a car because that's part of the world and chasing the world. Wouldn't go to the doctor because God would heal until he got real sick. But, but there was... There was uh, uh, an understanding, a concupiscence, if you will, a, a deep place in his mind. I am going to obey the law of God so that I will satisfy God and his grace will be sufficient for me. The man died in his sins. He died in his sins. 
and went to hell because he was walking after the flesh. You go, wait a minute, this guy's way more righteous than the other guy. It's because it doesn't have anything to do with your righteousness. It's a matter of what you're walking after. You see, you can take your flesh and not sin. You can, you can go to a monastery somewhere way out in the woods, and you can go all the way alone, and you can take a vow of silence, and you can sit there quietly eating millet or whatever that, that doesn't satisfy you every day, and deprive your body of sin as far as we can. But you're walking after the flesh. You're fulfilling things through the flesh. That's what you're doing. And you can get born again and, and be like Mary Magdalene or be like, like Peter who, who, was, who got born again and messed up. Paul wrote a whole book of Galatians rebuking a bunch of Christians for sinning, doing wrong. But their desire was to be closer to Jesus. They were walking after the Spirit. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate this more, but as I was pondering this this week, I, th I stayed up a bunch, kept my poor wife awake, staying awake thinking about this all week, thought about it when I was driving, when I was taking a shower. I thought about, I, I was trying to, to wrap my mind around how to explain this, articulate it well. And as I was doing that, I, I read about, my wife mentioned to me uh, something that she had read recently. And it was a, a young lady who was living in sin. She was living with her boyfriend and filled with alcohol and uh, all, all, bad language and all kinds of stuff for a long time. She'd been living that way for a long time. And periodically she would nod at God, but live after the flesh, fulfill the lust of the flesh. That was her, that was her track record. And her, I think her boyfriend was maybe abusive or something. There was an issue there. Moved out, real troubled, real dis, just disquieted. And went to her pastor, and her pastor said, well, let me read some passages to you. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And maybe some passages like, I know the plans he has for you to prosper and not to harm you. And then prayed with her. Man, she was just so happy. And she went back and moved back in with her boyfriend and said, everything's better with Jesus. Just, just so happy. Really, your fornication is better with Jesus? You think that Jesus is there? Well, you're, you think that he's happy with that? You think that's what those passages... What a, what a disgrace that a pastor would sit down and say, let's, let's look what God wants to do that's good for you and not say repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. You know, I, I know another young lady raised as a believer, raised in, in a Christian home, uh, got older and just dislikes God, dislikes what he stands for, all the stuff about God. And so she, she wrote a manifesto a while back and, and said, you know what? She said, the God that I knew when I was young was filled with things that I had to do to make him happy. But my Jesus doesn't care about those things. He wants me to be happy. You, you see the problem here is that he is her Jesus. He's not her master. He's her helper. In other words, she gets to go and live however she wants to live. And his responsibility is to come along and make her happy. His responsibility is come and fulfill those things that are lacking to fill them up so that she has joy in the midst of her sins. You know, this is what's taught in the church today. There's taught that you pray this magical prayer and then you live however you want. Do whatever you want. Act however you want and don't chase God for the rest of your life. But when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Friends, that's not what the Bible teaches. It's just not in there. If, if we told the prodigal son story, and we told it the way we teach church today. The prodigal son would have spent his inheritance, left his home, taken his inheritance, gone to the far world, spent his inheritance. His friends start to run off and leave him. He's there in the bar. He can't buy another, another shot because his inheritance is gone. And he goes, man, I wish I had more money. And here comes his dad with a wheelbarrow into the bar and pushes that up and says, I want you to have an abundant life. Here's more money. That's the way we treat Jesus. And he goes, oh, well, here's 10% of it back. Invest that for me and bring it back. And that's our idea. There's no repentance. There's no, I should go back to my, my father and seek him. There is an idea that God is going to seek me wherever I'm at and meet me and I can live and do whatever I want. Now, I'm not teaching legalism. Paul's not teaching legalism here. But I want to teach the converse of what's taught right on the line to pull us back to center. I want us to understand it, and here's why. I think this is important. I was reminded of this story I, I read in Reader's Digest a long time ago, 1986. 
it was April the 26th, 1986. There was 14 firemen. They were sitting in the, on duty watch, sitting in their fire station, and they got the call in that there was a fire in Chernobyl and the pumping station uh, on the number four power generation station. And that, that there, they needed to go down there and put the fire out, but it was okay. It was the auxiliary pump. There was no problem. Your, your, your personal protection equipment will, will suffice. You'll be safe. So they put their canvas pants on and, and they grabbed their helmets and their, and their respirators, their breathers, and they charged down there to pump number to, to station number four with their personal protection equipment and they started putting the fire out. And the chunks of concrete had gotten so hot they were glowing. So they're spraying those chunks of concrete, they're up on the building and they're, and they're spraying all that stuff. What they didn't know was that wasn't concrete, it was graphite. It came out of the bottom of the reactor when the rods exploded. And every minute that they were there, they were exposed to hundreds of times the amount of radiation you can live with. Within a few minutes, they started blistering. Within an hour, they were unconscious, some of them. They were weak and couldn't walk and in hospital beds. Within a few weeks, they were all dead. You know, the, the hospital, when they got there, they took those protective clothes off of them. They took them down to the basement, and they realized that their clothes had lethal radiation levels. They put a Geiger counter on them and realized they couldn't even be close to the clothes that these guys were wearing. Listen, there's going to come a day when we stand before God. There's going to be a lot of people that stand before him grinning. And they say, hey, look what I've done. I've, I've completed works in your name. I've gone to church. I've done this. And he goes, I don't know you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Wait. Wait, I prayed the prayer, but you're not my kid. You didn't follow me. You didn't love me. You didn't walk in the spirit. You spent your life walking after the flesh. Yeah, but I drove a horse and buggy. I wore broad falls. I wore suspenders. I didn't lie. Yeah, you did that in the flesh. You didn't have a relationship with me. You see, you didn't walk in the spirit. It's heavy, friends. It's heavy. And, and if you preach this, it won't, be, it won't be attractive to a lot of people. You know why it's not attractive? Because it's a message of repentance. It's a message that you need to come to Jesus and say, you, want, you are the Lord of my life. Do you know what that means? To make Jesus the Lord of your life, that means it's his decision, not yours, what you do with the rest of it. It's not just about not lying. It's about going to work on Monday. God, you're my Lord and my money's yours. My time is yours. My vehicle's yours. My shoes are your shoes. Where do you want them to walk? This is your mouth. What do you want me to do with it? These are your eyes. What do you want me to look at with them? I am your servant and you're my Lord and I'm going to follow you. That's not popular. You know why? Because we're selfish. We're filled with the desires of the flesh. And we want to coddle and fulfill those desires and not walk after the Spirit. Listen, if your focus, if your desire, if your purpose in life is to coddle and fulfill the desires of your flesh, including feeling good about it by going to church. If that's your purpose, when you die and you meet the eternal God, you'll meet him on your own, in your flesh. If your purpose is to say, Lord, you're my Lord, and if you say, no, I don't want to do it. If you say, this is what you want, that's what I want to do. If that's your purpose, listen, nothing else in your life matters. And you say, yeah, but you fornicated. Listen, you might, you might as a Christian, and then you'll go back to Jesus because you've repented towards him. And you'll turn away from that. And it might take years. It might be a process of a long time. But listen, if you're not closer to Jesus this year than last year, if you're not walking in the spirit, friends, be afraid. Fear God. Let's go through and look at some passages. Okay, Ezekiel. This is the reason I'm teaching this. Ezekiel, again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sins, and his righteousness with he, which he shall hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require of thine hand. God's told me to give a warning, and I'll give it just the way he said it. Acts 20, verse 29, Paul said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. What's the perverse things? They'll come and say, listen, God wants you to have a happy life. Go back to your boyfriend. Go back and be fulfilled and be happy. And say Jesus' name once in a while so you're a Christian. 
He said, people are going to come and they're going to speak perverse things and draw away men after them. It's popular. You'll get a big following. You'll fill a church up. Hey, have your best life now. Don't wait for eternity. Fill it up now. Have a good time. You'll get a lot of people. You get a lot of money. You get a lot of popularity. You'll get a lot of people burning in hell because you lied to them and told them that they don't need to follow Jesus. They could follow their own way and follow the flesh. He says, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone day and night with tears. Paul said, I'm a good watchman. I'm a good watchman. For three years, my whole life was spent. I was weeping before you. Friends, turn away from the flesh and turn to Jesus. That's my hope and my desire. Friends, that's what I want to do. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. What's unruly? Not following the rules. Warn them that don't follow the rules. Warn them what? Warn them you're in danger of hellfire. Not because you're not following the rules, but because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. It's the converse. You see, there's something called, if I, I can try to go through this fast. And this is by memory. I didn't look it up. Okay. There's, there's something called a strong and weak nuclear force. It holds your cells together. It holds particles together in your body. So you have protons and neutrons and you have inside these proton quirks what keeps the whole thing from exploding and going everywhere well the strong and nuclear force what are they don't know nobody really knows we can't we can't take it apart and parse it it's not a wave it's not a particle what is it we just named it the strong and weak nuclear force well how do we know it exists because you're not flying apart because you haven't disintegrated yet Something is holding that proton together and keeping the quirks from just bing, shooting out into everything and you from disintegrating. Now, we know that it's Jesus, it's Christ who holds all things together, the Bible tells us. But with physics, we don't know what it is, so we named it something. How do we know? Because we see the effect. If there's an effect, there's a cause behind the effect. You see, when we try to change the effect and walk in righteousness without changing the cause, it's a loser's game. It's, it's self-righteousness. It's not the righteousness of God. When we get close to Jesus, you'll see the effect. You can see it. James said it like this. If you say you have faith, I want to see it by your works. If I don't see it, I don't believe in your faith. That's not saying your works will save you. That's saying you don't have saving faith if you don't have works. Friends, it's all through the Bible. There is more passages about this than there are about grace. There's a lot of warning in the New Testament to be careful and to know that you know Jesus. Luke chapter 12, verse 4, and I say unto you, this is Jesus, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after have no more that they can do, but I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear, fear him, which after he hath killed you, killed hath the power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Listen, Jesus said, fear God. He said, listen, I don't worry about the guy that can crucify you, worry about the guy that can cast you into hell. Now you say, but perfect love cast out fear. That's right. A relationship with Jesus. Fear him enough to find the relationship. Okay. That was the intro of why I'm, I'm going through this. What, you thought I was done preaching? <laughs> Romans chapter 8. I, I thought about this all week, teaching verse 13 and how to, how to teach it and why. And I felt like that's what God uh, directed me toward very clearly. Okay, birthrights. Contrast to flesh and spirit. We went over that last week. Who you are now. That's all that matters is who you are. What you do points back to who you are. But that's all that matters is who you are. A child of God or not. Freedom in the spirit. That's what we'll look at uh, uh, today. And then suffering because of that birthright. So last week we started with, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's a thought. That's a final finished thought right there. Friends, if you're in Christ Jesus, there is no more condemnation. Someone can't come to you and say, yeah, but your life is, no, I am in Christ Jesus and there is no more condemnation. That is not in opposition to the first intro. That's in absolute harmony and Paul will show us how. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. That's a descriptor of who's in Christ Jesus. You walk after the spirit. This doesn't mean that you're perfectly righteous. This means that your desire and focus and intent, your direction is towards God because that's who your master and your Lord is. That's what you're doing. We looked last week at the born of Adam, flesh or the water, 
and the kingdom that is identified by sin, death, and darkness are born again, born in Jesus, and a kingdom that's identified by life, light, and righteousness. He's talked about those adjectives all through Romans, and he says, listen, if you say you're in the red column, the born again of Jesus, but you're living in sin, death, and darkness, you're not in the red column. If you're in the red column, it will be seen by the life, light, and righteousness. Those are the two laws of the kingdom of the Spirit that we read about last week, and then 8.4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So those of us that are in Christ are walking after the Spirit, and God's righteousness is fulfilled in that our bodies have died in Christ. 8.8, eight, so then they which are in the flesh cannot please God. It doesn't matter how good you are if you're in the flesh. You can never please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Again, that's a declarative statement. If the Spirit of God is in you, you're not in the flesh, you're in the Spirit. It's something that God does, and it's in a miracle, and you can't add to that, being in the Spirit. That's the cause, not the action. The action follows. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You can't work your way into that position. Okay, new, new territory, Romans 8.10. Well, I'm going to, uh, not new territory, I'm going to catch up from last week. And if, see that if, that's conditional, right? If, what's the condition? Christ be in you. That's the condition. Not if you don't sin, not if you don't sin much, not if you don't sin a long time. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwell in you. He says, listen, if you're a child of God, and you're born again, God is going to give you a brand new body. He's going to give you a body that will, that will be spiritual and eternal, eternal, so your responsibility is to him and not to your flesh. Therefore, so he says, because of that, because of what I just said, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Now, what he's saying here in Romans 12 is that if you're born again, you're in the spirit, not in the flesh. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're in the Spirit, you're not in the flesh. If you're in the Spirit and led by the Spirit, then, then you're not a debtor to the flesh because your flesh has already had an expiration date put on it. It's already been condemned to death. He said he condemned sin in the flesh. It's condemned to death and your flesh is just going to go away. But he said he's got a brand new body for you. Because he has a brand new body for you and you're in the Spirit, you have no more indebtedness to your flesh. In other words... You tell your flesh, I'm not going to sit at the buffet and eat till I'm sick. And your flesh goes, Wah, I want to eat more. I'm not, I'm not happy. And you go, yeah, but you're not my master. You see, the Lord's already got me a brand new body. You're the old model. I'm waiting on the new thing. I, I don't care what you want. And your flesh says, yeah, but, uh, but she looks good. I want her. And your, body says, and your spirit says, but Jesus said. And, and, and your flesh says, yeah, but, but, but what about me? And, you, and, your, and your spirit says, yeah, what about you? You're already dead. You, you, you already have passed away. And I got a new model. And the new one's better than the old one. And I don't care what the old one. In other words, you're fiduciary of Jesus Christ and of the spirit and not of the flesh. Understand fiduciary like a, an attorney. So an attorney is, is, your, is, is your representative, right? If you go and you hire an attorney and you pay them, under the law, that re attorney represents you now. They don't represent themselves. They don't represent the law. They represent you. And their purpose is to see your best interest fulfilled. Whatever they believe your best interest is, that's their design and their purpose because they're your attorney. They're your fiduciary, if you will. They're the, their responsibility is to you. If you, have a, if you have a doctor, they have a fiduciary commitment to you that they first won't do any harm and that they will keep your your uh, information private that's their responsibility to you because they are your uh, an extension of your will you've hired them to do something for you so their responsibility is toward you you understand fiduciary so so what what Paul says is listen the flesh is dead he's condemned it it's passed away your responsibility is no longer to the flesh but you have a fiduciary responsibility to your Lord and Master in the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit. 
And then he says, for if you live after the flesh, in other words, if your focus and desire, if you're feeding the flesh and not the spirit, if you're, if you're still considering yourself as a, a fiduciary of your flesh, in other words, that, that it's in the driver's seat, then you are, uh, then, then you'll die. You shall die. That's, that's that you're not born again yet because the flesh is in the driver's seat. You're not a child of God. But it says, if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now, mortify is an interesting word. It's, it's to put to death. But more than that, after the thing's been put to death, a mortician comes along and prepares it for burial, right? So he's not saying to, to put your body to death, but the deeds of the body. He says, listen, the body has some desire, okay? The body, the body wants to have illicit sex. It just does. It just wants this fulfillment. It doesn't have anything to do with morality. Your body just says, I'm hungry. We're on an island full of chickens. You know why? Because they have a lot of copulation. They have a lot of ch baby chickens. Look around. There's baby chickens everywhere. We're drowning in chickens. They're not evil. They're just chickens. They want to they do the deed and make baby chickens. It's their drive. Your body, your physical body has a desire in the flesh. It wants something. If your life is spent feeding that desire to the best of your ability, you're walking after this flesh. But if instead you say the flesh is dead because of Christ's work, and what I want to do is get closer to Jesus and deny that flesh the things that it wants, then you're walking after the spirit. Now, it's not a level in other words, you can have somebody that's a lot more righteous, as far as we can tell, that's living after the flesh. Because his desire is to be righteous. It's to feel good about himself. It's to thumb his nose and say, I'm better than you are. I've been in the living room of those guys that will say, I'm better than you are. I live better than you do. I'm more righteous than you do because I don't believe in that easy believism that you can just get saved and, and be a child of God. I believe it's a process and I have to... I have to accomplish the process so the grace of God can cover me. Listen, you're never going to get saved that way. All you're ever going to do is be a slave to your flesh, trying to fulfill the righteousness with your flesh, and it won't work because you can't ever happen. But if I focus on Jesus and on him and get closer to him, then the righteousness of God is fulfilled in me in my life because I'm always coming towards him. It's not a level. It's an attitude. It's not, it's not where I'm at now. It's where I want to go and where I'm focused. It's where I want to be. I want to be with Jesus. He's my focus and my direction. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. In other words, a Christian doesn't let the flesh rule. He walks in the Spirit. He chooses to. Why? Because Jesus is his Lord. And you say, yeah, but so you're saying if you fornicate, you go to hell. I'm not saying that at all. A lot of Christians have fallen into fornication. And, and we read about them. I'm not just saying that. Read the book of Corinthians. That was a huge problem. And yet, 2 Corinthians said that brother was restored in repentance. Listen, I'm not saying that you do this or you go to hell. I'm saying you love him or you go to hell. You understand the difference? And loving him has consequences. And those consequences are walking after the Spirit. That's what Paul's telling us. You know why he's telling us? Because he doesn't want to have a room full of toxic waste in heaven somewhere that was your righteousness as all as filthy rags that was cast aside while you're cast in the lake of fire. He doesn't want you to trust your flesh. He wants you to walk after the spirit and, and to leave the works of the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For, uh, Colossians 3.1, it expounds on this. Paul's still writing, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's what Ryan talked about this morning. Seeking the things that are above. Seeking to, to the things that are good and righteous and peace and holiness. We're going to seek those and not the things here. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things of the earth. That's what he was talking about with those podcasts. That there's politics, there's this, there's that. It's not that those things are evil. It's just that those things are second fiddle to, to our fourth or fifth fiddle to the work of Jesus Christ and what he's done. Listen, it doesn't have to be politics. It can be ball games. You can have your affection in ball games instead of in God, and you're walking after the flesh. You can memorize all of the stats of all the football players in America 
and walk after the flesh and, and not walk after the spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that if you memorize stats, you're going to go to hell. That's not what I'm saying at all. Here's our problem. As soon as we talk about something like this, our mind, we go, okay, well, how much is too much? Like, how much can I walk after the flesh before I'm walking after the flesh? You know what I mean? Like, how, how, how much can I give up to that thing and still be okay? Friends, that's the wrong question. That's a bad heart question. And here's why. There's two reasons to know that. Both wins are problems. I, there's two practical reasons. There's theoretical, which is fun. But, but there, there's two practical reasons, if you're not a nerd, to know this. And, and the one practical reason is how much sin can I get away with? Listen, if that's your heart, I'll tell you now you're walking after the flesh. Trust Jesus. Let him into your heart. Make him the Lord of your life. If you want to know how much sin you can get away with, you've got a problem in your life. Fear God and, and, and run to Jesus. I'm not saying you're lost necessarily. You might be. I'm not saying you are. But Paul says fear. Fear lest any of you should come, after, uh, lest any of you should come short. Never mind. I can't quote Hebrews. So, so <laughs> I'll get it tomorrow when I'm not thinking about it. The, so, so he says, listen, there's the, I'm saying there's two, there's two issues to know. One is how much sin can I get away with? The other is... How can I categorize that other guy, right? That's the two reasons we need to know how much sin you can get away with. Because that guy's not doing as good as me. I don't think he's a Christian, right? I think, I, you heard him swear, I don't think he's saved. That's our two reasons. What did he say about that? Don't try separating the wheat and the tares. You're going to mess stuff up. That's my position, not yours. You need to just be quiet and seek God. You don't need to try to, to root people out and say, you repent or you're going to hell. You need to say, you repent towards Jesus or all of us are going to hell. That's what we're doing is we're repenting towards Jesus every day. And if you don't know him, it's easy. Come to know him. Study. If you say, well, how do I do that? Open the word of God. Open it and read it. Read it until you know him. And you know what? It's, it's not difficult. It's not hard. It's simple faith. It's just trusting in him. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things of earth. Why? For you're dead and your life is hid with Christ. Here we hid with Christ in God. That's exactly what he said in Romans. You're, listen, your body's already passed away. So stop seeking the things of the flesh and seek the things of the spirit. If that's your, your relationship. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. He says, listen, uh, remember back in, in, uh, um, in Romans, he said, listen, your body is dead, but you have a brand new body. Therefore, you're not to have to seek after the physical things because you've already got a spiritual body waiting for you. He says the same thing in Colossians. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you shall appear with him in glory. Listen, you don't have any fiduciary responsibility to your flesh because it's dead because you've got a new one and a better one that's coming. And then he says, mortify, therefore, same thing he said in Romans. Because of that, because of who you are in Christ, mortify your members, which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affections, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. He says, listen, put to death the things that are in the flesh and don't do them. One of them is fornication. The pastor that sat with that young lady should have said, repent. He should have opened the book of Colossians and said, listen, if you want to seek the things which are above, if your life is hid in Christ, then you reject those things and you walk in purity and holiness. And God will restore you and God will fill you with the joy of the, of the Lord and you'll walk in his ways and grow in him and God will provide you a wonderful husband if that's in his will. And at that time, you'll get married and then you'll have those kind of relationships, but not until then because you're a child of God. And if you don't want to repent, don't come to church for feeling better. Because if we teach the message of, uh, that's in the scripture, church ain't going to make you feel better. It's not what it's here for. It's not here to cover and make your sins feel good about your sins. It's so you'll repent and turn to Jesus. That's what we study the scripture for. Listen, it happens to me every week. I open the word of God. I study it. And God says, son, what about that day? What about over here? Ah, there's another one. Listen, every year, every week, I, I, I can look back where I was three or four years ago and I just shake my head at that guy, that immature believer that didn't know the things of the Lord the way he does today because I'm growing and walking towards the Lord. I'm growing in him. Listen, there, there's not an end to it. I got to preach faster. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
Jesus said in John 8, 12, Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but ye shall have the light of life. Listen, how do you get the light of life? Following Jesus. What does that mean? To keep his words. Remember the, the story about the, the guy that built a castle in the sand and the one that built the castle in the rock? What was the rock? It was the words of God. He said, if you keep my words, you're like a man who's built his castle on a rock. Listen, if you with your mouth say, I trust Jesus, but with your actions say, I'm not going to keep his words, you're building your house on sand, building on a rock. There is no more important thing in your life than what Jesus says. Now, if you start talking about what the Bible says, people will say, I don't agree with that. You start talking about the position of husband and wife, right? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. I don't agree with that. People will tell you that straight up with a straight face. I don't agree with that. Well, okay, I didn't write it. I, I'm not the one that put it in there. God is. If you don't agree with God, your problem, not mine. I'm just telling you what it says. You talk about divorce. Well, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Not my problem, man. Jesus said there's three reasons you can get divorced. If you don't fall in those three categories and you get divorced, you're disobedient and sinning against God. You, well, I don't agree with that. I don't care. The Bible doesn't care. The Bible says this is what Jesus says. Follow it. Follow it. And if you don't want to follow it, you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. You say, that's unkind. No. What's unkind is telling you, friends, go put the fire out. Your canvas is going to protect you. That's hateful. That's rude and mean and murderous to those men. You tell them there is a leak, radiation's everywhere, and if you come anywhere close, you're going to die. And even then, if they make the choice, that's the loving thing to do. Even if they choose to go put the fire out because the guys were heroes. But as the teacher, as the watchman, tell the truth, follow Jesus or die. Jesus said in 12, John 12, 46, I am come a light unto the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. He said, follow me and you won't be in darkness. Believe on me and you won't be in darkness. The two are absolutely connected. If you believe him, you follow him. Listen, he's got the light and he's walking on to glory. Stay in the light. Don't veer off to the right nor the left. Don't, your position is not to decide what's right and wrong. Your position is to come to the faith, to Christ's faith, and find out what he says is right and wrong. That's all that matters. Ephesians 5, 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is that acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Friends, that's what I'm doing this morning. I'm reproving the unfruitful works of darkness, and it's not popular. And people don't like it. Because he said that the light came in the world and they didn't like the light because their deeds were evil. It's not a popular thing to do. It's not going to get a lot of clicks or views because it calls for repentance towards God. But friends, it's everlasting life. It's a hope in the eternal, a hope in glory. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. John, 1 John 1.5 this, then, is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. You see, it's not a matter of the amount. It's not a matter of have you fornicated three times, you're okay, seven times, you're going to hell. That's not, that's not the issue. The issue is, are you walking in the light saying, Lord, illuminate my life and show me because I want to walk closer to you. Lord, I stumbled and fell. I'm, I'm here. Pick me up. Carry me with you. I want to be closer. You know, the opposite of this is to pick up a pride flag and march down the street and say, I'm proud of the fact that I'm against the law of God. And you, walk, and you march with those. That's, against, that's not walking in the light. It's walking in the darkness. It's objectively walking in the darkness. It's not me saying it. God said, don't do that. If you do that, you're proud of it. You're walking in it. You're walking in darkness. You say, well, then if you do that, you're going to hell. No, it's not a matter of things. It's a matter of reasons. It's a matter of why. He says, if you walk in darkness, you lie in and you're, you're not in him. First John 1, 7. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Friends, it's, it's not an issue of your sin. You understand that? Sin has been covered. It's an issue of your hope. It's an issue of your joy. It's an issue of your desire for him. It's an issue of wanting to be closer to him. It's a misnomer to just talk about repenting of your sins. It's not about that. It's about repenting towards Jesus. Repenting towards God, saying, God, your way and not my way. He says that if we walk in the light, that the blood of Christ his son cleanses us from all sins. Continue in 1 John 2, 3. And hereby do we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his words, word in him verily, is the love of God perfected, and hereby know that we are in him. He says, listen, if you say that you're in him and you don't keep his commandments, be afraid. But if you're in him, there's no more fear. You're in him, and he'll take care of you. They're not juxtaposed. They're not either or. They're yes and and. They, they are together. That, that God covers my sin, and, and my sin has no relevance to my salvation but my salvation causes me to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh romans 8 12 therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh you follow that a little more not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if ye live after the flesh ye shall die but if through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body ye shall live you understand the, the, the context, the flow of that, he's saying, if your Lord and Master is your flesh, you're going to go to hell. But if your Lord and Master is Jesus Christ, you'll walk like it is. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I will get into adoption next time. I spoke too long. Okay, um, I know this is harsh. I, I wish that I could talk for three or four hours at a time so that I could encapsulate the entirety of Romans 8 instead of these pieces. This piece, if it's a standalone, sounds almost legalistic. It is not. Understand it in the context of what went on before who you are in Christ and the adoption that comes right after this. But this piece, specifically verse 13, deals with the topic that I dealt with today. And as a, as a steward of the word of God, it's not my right to skip over it because it's harsh uh, or because it sounds judgy. I'm to give a warning because that's uh, what God has called us to do is to, to, to parse the scripture as it's written. Let's pray.